Behind me stands the beautiful borough of Hanover, Pennsylvania, my home town. My name is Aaron Smith, and this is Forward Gettysburg. And today, we're talking about the Battle of Hanover. Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Forward Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. Right now, I'm standing in downtown Hanover. This is a busy, bustling industrial hub here in central Pennsylvania, 10 to 15 miles to the east of Gettysburg. And on June 30th, Judson Kilpatrick and his division of Union Cavalry is going to arrive here in town. Judson Kilpatrick's division of cavalry, they were sent forward as part of Pleasanton's overall plan to scout the North and make contact with the Confederate forces to scout and see where they were at. They knew the Confederates were operating somewhere in York County, Adams County, and Franklin County. So this is going to be the right flank of that scouting mission by Pleasanton. Meanwhile, Jeb Stewart's venerated cavalry division in the Army of Northern Virginia, they are trying to find where Yule is just north. They knew that Yule was somewhere near York, but they weren't sure exactly where Yule was. So they're trying to meet up with Yule. Part of their mission from Robert E. Lee was to meet up with Yule after going around the Union Army. So they figured Yule was somewhere in, in York. So they are here in Hanover in this general area, just about 20 miles to the west of York, Pennsylvania. Early in the morning, freshly promoted Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer is going to ride through town here and tell the townsfolk to look out for a lot of hungry Yanks coming up in the rear. Shortly after that, Judson Kilpatrick will ride through town to the astonishment and amazement and, and pleasant welcomings by the townsfolk. Now on June 27th, an element of Confederate cavalry had come here through Hanover. The 35th North Carolina under Elijah White, about 150 men came through Hanover, procured a bunch of supplies. We're talking shoes, horses, uh, food, uh, all those kind of things that a cavalry force would need to live on as, as they're traveling throughout the land. And they're gonna pay for a lot of those supplies in useless Confederate script. And even leading up to this, once news of Lee's invasion reached this area of Pennsylvania, which really wasn't too far off from Chambersburg and Greencastle, where they crossed the border into Pennsylvania, every single day the newspaper was filled with, the Rebs are coming, the Rebs are coming. So to see elements of the Union cavalry riding through town, it was a moment of great elation for the townsfolk of Hanover. And they're going to greet these cavalry men with songs and cheers in the street and Kilpatrick is actually going to set up post here in Center Square, Hanover. And Kilpatrick is looking for a man by the name of Jacob Wirt. Jacob Wirt was a civic leader and businessman in Hanover at the time. In fact, there's a park just a few blocks away from here named after him, Wirt Park. Not only that, he was an avid Republican and a conductor on the Underground Railroad. He would help lead slaves heading for the north from southwestern York County, this area of York County, to the center of the county at York, Pennsylvania. And the reason Kilpatrick wanted to find Wirt is because rumor had it Wirt had a very, very detailed map of Hanover and the surrounding roads in his home. He's eventually going to link up with Wirt find this map, ask him a whole bunch of questions about the roads. Obviously, Wirt was a very, very well-educated man about the roads here in Hanover if he was conducting on the Underground Railroad. So he was the guy to talk to for navigation in the area. He's going to meet up with Wirt, take a look at his map, get the information he needs, and then he is going to head out the direction of the Abbottstown Pike, which is this road just running this way, to go up to Abbottstown. As Kilpatrick departs, he is going to leave behind the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry to picket the road leading to the southwest towards Littlestown. 
behind me is a monument in Center Sport Hanover called the Picket, dedicated in 1904. Originally, it was in the center of the square. The square was originally a circle. However, in the 1960s, they're going to redo the, the road layout here through center of town and move it to this corner of the square. Judson Kilpatrick and his men are going through Hanover, being celebrated, their appearance, their arrival, being celebrated by the townsfolk. Judson Kill Cavalry Kilpatrick, nicknamed Kill Cavalry due to his aggressive and costly and bloody tactics during the American Civil War. As that's all going in at Center Square, maybe a mile or two up that way, Jeb Stewart's Confederate Cavalry Division is headed towards Hanover. Now they had just departed Union Mills that morning around nine o'clock in the morning and they are traveling over some very very hilly terrain. The road from Union Mills to Hanover is analogous to a roller coaster. It's up and down, windy, turny, very, very tough terrain to travel. Not only that, but they had that 125 wagon wagon train that they captured just outside of DC. So they have to deal with all those wagons. And on top of that, it had been raining for a few days leading up to the 30th of June. So this is going to be a very, very tough traverse for Stewart's men. And these men have been riding desperate to link up with Yule's second core of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. They've been riding for some days straight now, some men falling asleep in the saddle. They, they are just truly exhausted. And to add this trek on top of it, this, this leg of the journey is just overwhelming for the men. But nonetheless, they're going to make their way to the south of Hanover. And they're going to start as they approach Hanover to encounter Union cavalry pickets. And they're going to drive those pickets. There's going to be some skirmishing. They're going to drive them back towards Hanover. They're finally going to reach this area. This is an eminence that I'm in the Mount Olivet Cemetery just south of town alongside the Hanover Pike. And this uh, eminence, th this rise of ground was known as Rice Hill at the time of the battle. So they're going to reach this area. The lead elements of Stuart's division, they're going to meet a few scattered companies of that 18th Pennsylvania. And they're gonna take 25 men of Company G of the 18th Pennsylvania prisoner. And as they reach town, the second North Carolina, the vanguard of Stuart's troops on this trek to Hanover, they're going to strike the pickets of the 18th Pennsylvania Cavalry that are lining Frederick Street just behind me, maybe a block or two that way, block or two to the north, and they're going to strike them, and they're going to cut them in half. They're going to send the left flank of that picket headed right back in toward town, the right flank. They're going to retreat forward to the north and to the west to try to escape the oncoming Confederates. Meanwhile, Chambliss's brigade is now reaching the field for the south, and they're going to set up artillery positions here on Rice Hill and start to bombard the retreating Union cavalrymen. And now the citizens of Hanover, who once were celebrating the cavalrymen of the north coming through their town, no doubt keeping them safe from the Confederate invasion, they now get to witness those same men retreat through their streets. And those men are going to retreat back towards the square of Hanover. So as Chambliss is firing his artillery south of town, Judson Kilpatrick had made his way to the Pigeon Hills, probably somewhere in this area. This is Hershey Heights Road right behind me. And as those cannons south of town are going off, he's going to hear their reports all the way in the Pigeon Hills here. And he's going to turn around and send what part of his cavalry division he has with him back towards the town of Hanover. Judson Kilpatrick is riding back into town, his horse traveling at breakneck galloping speeds. He's going to send off a messenger for the for Custer's force, which is now over in Littlestown, to come to Hanover. And Ellen Farnsworth's brigade, which is with Kilpatrick, they are going to come in from the northeast of town to Center Square. So I'm now to the southwest of Hanover, and at the time of the battle on June 30th, 1863, 
this would have been the Carl Forney farm. This area would see a lot of action, a lot of cavalry clashing. Now remember, we have Ellen Farnsworth's brigade and they're coming down from Abbottstown. They're coming through Center Square. They're coming out here to the west and they are going to strike the flank of the second North Carolina who has split that 18th Pennsylvania cavalry in half. They're going to strike their flank and the fifth New York followed by the first West Virginia, they're going to strike the flank and smash the North Carolinians flank. The situation quickly becomes confusing and here we have Jeb Stewart himself to see what's going on and as him and an adjutant rides together up to this area and they see what is happening here they quickly realize they are soon to be surrounded so Stewart and his adjutant they're going to turn around and tuck tail and retreat backwards and they're going to retreat backwards with some speed now behind me runs what I'm going to call Stewart's ditch and at the time of this battle the ditch would have been about 15 wide and probably about five feet deep due to erosion development in the area you guys can see this is a very residential area now remember this was all farm field during the time of the battle of hanover but due to erosion you know uh, uh, residential development all those kind of things this ditch is considerably smaller but it is said that Jeb Stewart is going to leap this ditch in his retreat. It's a glorious moment of the war. When you think of dashing cavalrymen and their equine dressage hunter jumper uh, exploits on the battlefield, the mastery of their horses, this is the type of thing that really, really comes to mind. And his adjutant general, H.B. McClellan, is going to say, he's going to describe this jump. The position soon became one of extreme personal peril to Stuart, whose retreat was cut off. Nothing remained but to leap the ditch. Splendidly mounted upon his favorite mare, Virginia, Stuart took the ditch at a running leap and landed safely on the other side with several feet to spare. Kilpatrick eventually is going to arrive in town, his horse dying from the breakneck gallop, the pace that they took to arrive into town. The Confederates realizing that they're surrounded, that this is not the great, greatest position in the world, realizing that they're quickly becoming outnumbered. Around noon, they're going to break off contact with the Union cavalrymen of Ellen Farnsworth's brigade under Judson kill Patrick's cavalry and there's going to be a lull in the fighting. So now I'm standing on an area of town that would have been known as Bunker Hill in June of 1863. Now you have to imagine none of this development, none of these houses, nothing would have been out here. This probably would have been all farm fields. The town of Hanover itself again was very very small at the time of the battle. It was about 1400 people. So at noon, around noon, June 30th, 1863, we have this lull in the fighting and both armies are going to start to reinforce. Jeb Stewart is going to bring up the brigades of Hampton and Fitzhugh Lee and his position is going to extend from the southeast of town to the southwest of town now. In the meantime, Judson Kilpatrick, he is reinforcing as well. He is receiving George Custer's Michigan Cavalry, George Custer, a freshly brand new minted Brigadier General. He is going to reinforce and he's going to take over for the 5th New York and the 1st West Virginia out there west of town. So right now I'm standing in the parking lot of Good Field here on the west side of Hanover right off of Frederick Street. Now like I said before and like the theme of this episode it is really this battlefield has been developed over. There are houses, businesses, um, industrial parks, all kinds of things on this battlefield. So interpretation becomes a little bit difficult. But I've surmised that Custer's brigade would have come in from town, from the west, of course, from Littlestown, and they would have taken up positions right along this area. And this is where Custer is going to launch a few attacks later in the day. Meanwhile, here on Bunker Hill, the Union are going to place their artillery. And at about two in the afternoon, an artillery duel is going to commence with the Union batteries here north of town and the Southern batteries to the south of town. And this is going to be a terrible, terrible artillery duel for the townsfolk of Hanover. This duel is gonna last for about two hours till about four or 5 p.m. in the afternoon, early evening. 
I thought the camera was going to fall there. I had to be careful. It's a little windy outside today. But it's a gorgeous day, so that's why I'm out here filming. So this artillery duel is going to last for some time. And it is going to be absolutely horrific for the people of Hanover. The shells are going to hit buildings, smash in the brick. It's going to be absolutely devastating. There's one family, the Weinbrenner family. They're going to be out on their front porch. And they're nearly going to be killed by an artillery shell that strikes the upper floor of their house in town. So this is an absolutely devastating artillery duel. The townsfolk of Hanover are now horrified. The Civil War has truly come to their doorstep. And now they are living through the horrors, the horrors that the people of Fredericksburg probably lived through. They are seeing that on a smaller scale here in the streets and in the houses of Hanover. The correction I wanted to make, the first cemetery was Rest Haven, not Mount Olivet. So that was, um, as they say, my bad. So I do apologize for that. So as this artillery duel is going on, as the people of Hanover are being subjected to this terrible, terrible shelling between the two sides, the north and the south, Custer is going to dismount his 6th Michigan Cavalry and send them forward dismounted. And they're going to strike that second North Carolina line right there where Chambliss is, where those guns are on that rice hill area and the first attack is not going to be successful they're going to end up being flanked just want to make sure traffic wasn't coming they're going to end up being flanked and they're going to lose about 15 men as prisoners however they're going to regroup and attack again and their main plan is to secure that frederick Littlestown Hanover Pike, now commonly known as Frederick Street in Hanover. It runs all the way to Littlestown, Tawny Town, down to Frederick. They want to secure that because at Littlestown is the 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac under Henry Slocum. They will be successful. They will secure that road in Union hands. That will be firmly in Union control. And now their communication line is secure and they can send for the 12th Corps. However, Stuart and Kilpatrick, they are going to refrain from further aggressive actions. There will be some minor skirmishing, there will be some minor probing actions throughout the day, but by the evening there were no more major aggressive actions from either side. Stuart didn't want to attack because Stuart could not afford to be delayed any further. Stuart had to reach Yule's second course. Stuart had to reach communication with Lee. Up to this point on June 30th, Stuart had a communicated with Robert E. Lee for five or six days at this point. Robert E. Lee is totally blind. Sure, there are some small independent cavalry detachments with, Ewer, with Ewell's Second Corps, but outside of that, his main force, his most trusted cavalry commander has been radio silent, as they say. He has not been in communication. So Stuart is going to steal away in the middle of night to the northeast of town, and he is going to head toward Jefferson, Pennsylvania. And he, again, he's operating off of his last dispatch, the last knowledge he had that Yule was somewhere in the area of York, PA. If you guys get a chance to check out Jefferson, Jefferson has, and good friend of the show, Matt Atkinson, let me in on this. Jefferson has an example of an Iron Napoleon 12 pounder in their town circle, which is, if you know anything about, about artillery, you know that almost all 12 pounders are made of bronze. So that is really, really cool. If you get a chance to check that out, make sure you go see it. But either way, Stuart is going to steal away under the cover of darkness. He's going to head to the east toward Jefferson, then head out toward York. He's going to get delayed, head up toward Dover, and, and, and he's going to desperately, desperately try to reconnect with Yule's Second Corps, who by this point are on their way to Gettysburg. Well, guys, that's what I have for you for this episode of Forward Gettysburg. Thank you so much for joining me as I talk about the really, really cool Civil War action that happens here in my hometown of Hanover, Pennsylvania. If you get a chance, come out, check out Hanover. There has been a huge, huge urge, a huge push in recent years to, to mark and memorialize some of the areas in town where this action happened. There are markers very much like you would see at the Gettysburg Battlefield at different spots throughout Hanover. And even around the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, they will have Battle of Hanover 
town tours led by a battlefield guide so make sure you guys get out here and check this out like i said this is a whole different beast compared to gettysburg the battlefield itself is is developed over so you're gonna have to use your imagination you're gonna have to in your mind plow down all these buildings and replace it with farm fields essentially at the end of the day at the battle of hanover there will be about 300 casualties and the next day on july 1st the fifth corps of the army of the potomac with the 20th maine and strong vincent's brigade in the lead they're going to march through hanover and see the aftermath of the cavalry clash here no doubt bringing a more serious tone to their march as they head toward destiny in gettysburg pennsylvania as always, my name is Aaron Smith. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me today on Forward Gettysburg. If you guys are enjoying the channel, if you guys are enjoying the videos, if you're enjoying this more off the beaten path type of, of content and, and topic, let me know in the comments below. And as always, I will see you on the next one.